I want to start by um, try to keep on my time here by drawing our attention to the most celebrated African American academic, and uh, this is Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois. And 120 years ago, his canonical "Souls on Black Folk" came out. And the interesting thing is that when "Souls of Black Folk" was published in 1903. Uh, there was no concert industry around jazz music. The jazz age has, hadn't even emerged yet, right? Let alone rock and roll. There was no soul, blues, R&B, hip hop, disco. Uh, none of these genres of music existed. African-Americans as central to the expression of popular music in the United States in its commercial forms, making millions and then hundreds of millions and then ultimately billions, uh, none of that existed. So at this moment, in fact, most Black people were still in the South. About 90% of Black people still lived in the South. And most of those Black people lived in the South. Not only could they not vote, they were tied to the land as quasi-peasants, as sharecroppers, um, subsistence farmers. And uh, Black people were rural Southern people. Again, no rock and roll, no, no Duke Ellington, no Ella Fitzgerald. And this is what he said about music. As his observation, someone from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, up here in New England, where I am now, uh, who had ventured down south and went to school and then worked. And at this point, he was working at Atlanta University, writing in Stone Hall. He wrote, I know little of music and I can say nothing of technical phrase, but I know something of men. And knowing them, I know that these songs are the articulate message of the slave to the world. And what Du Bois said here in terms of this, this message of the, the slave to the world, he's not referring to literally people who are enslaved because this is a generation or more than a generation after slavery, but he's referring to the most economically, politically disempowered people in society. Those people on the extreme margins of society, the most powerless people of society. And even in their inability to grasp the reins of power at that particular moment in their lives, they offer the world an articulate message, right? And there's something about the power of music to transcend spaces of power, transcend people from the margins uh, to the mainstream. And so it's a very prescient, in many ways, observation that sort of anticipates what jazz were evolving to, right? It anticipates what rock and roll will become. It anticipates what R&B, it anticipates what soul, and it ultimately anticipates rock hip hop itself, right? So it anticipates those people from the extreme margins and what they can offer to the world and their message. And well, let's jump up a generation or so, actually, Two, two and a half generations, and we look at say 30 years or 25 years as a generation. And this is what Dr. King says, and this is 61 years after Du Bois's comment, and nearly 60 years from today. And so uh, Du Bois, midway between us and, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Dr. King, midway between our day and Du Bois's day, he writes about jazz. And this is after jazz had emerged as America's truly unique cultural offering to the world, right? An art form that had come from African-Americans in the South had become, uh, was, was uh, uh, doggedly attacked by hostile forces in the ivory tower. Um, there were all sorts of people who thought that jazz was uh, not real music. It sat outside the confines of how music was defined in the Western sense. It was castigated, it was vilified, it was called N-word music without the polite N-word. It was uh, seen as jungle music but ultimately became the most popular art form in the United States, beloved by Americans of multiple generations by the time you get to the 1960s, exported around the world, right? And there at the Berlin Jazz Festival in Germany, 10 years, 20 years after World War II, um, there's this huge festival in, and Dr. King wrote that God has wrought many things out of oppression. He has endowed his creators with the capacity to create and from this capacity has flowed the sweet songs of sorrow and joy that have allowed man to cope with his environment in many different situations. Jazz speaks for life. The blues tells the story of life's difficulties. When you think for a moment, you will realize that they take the hardest realities of life and put them into music only to come out with some new hope or a sense of triumph. This is triumphant music. And so Dr. King himself sort of anchored his message with a particular hindsight that intersects with the foresight of his predecessor. And so if you look at King now, and let's, let's now look at King as our most iconic representation of any social movement. 
and this is just not in the United States, but globally. So we have five pillars of nonviolence that Dr. King offered. And this is what he said about his struggle, the struggle that he and hundreds of thousands of others were engaged in in the, the long civil rights movement or the, the modern civil rights movement. He said that this is not a movement of cowards, it does resist. And this is how he understood a nonviolent strategy. It does not seek to defeat or humiliate the opponent, but to win his friendship and understanding. Campaigns are waged against evil rather than those caught up in that system. It avoids external violence, but also internal violence of spirit. One cannot be consumed by bitterness or hate. Finally, the method of nonviolence is based on the conviction that the universe is on the side of justice. And now I want to shift our attention to poetry and how we might imagine these artists and how hip hop themselves might offer through their word the sorts of social observations and perhaps something that might be adjacent to a movement. There's a uh, famous English poet from the uh, 17th century. He writes that uh, poetry lifts the veil from the hidden beauty of the world and makes familiar objects be as if they were not familiar. And so we think about poets and, and well-known poets. I have two poets in front of us here and I have the lines of, of two different poets. And uh, I would offer this up to people to say, you know, if they could, and Dr. Walton probably knows this since he's a, a, a polymath of a scholar of sorts. So he knows different uh, disciplines and uh, he might know uh, literature uh, as well as history and a whole bunch of other things. So this might be easier for other people who are on this call. But right here, one person says, I'm not gonna, he says, I'm gonna write something, some, let me start from the beginning. I'm gonna write me some music about Daybreak in Alabama. I'm going to put the prettiest songs in it, rising out of the ground like a swamp mist and falling out of heaven like soft dew. Someone else says, hell raising, wheel chasing, newly world, new worldly possessions, flesh making, spirit breaking, which one would you lessen? The better part, the human part, you love them or dissect them, happiness or flashiness? How do you serve the question? So here are two celebrated poets. Um, these poets are separated by generations. And because this is a short call, I can't get into a lot of literary analysis and we have to kind of quickly move on, but just to set the stage for how we understand poetry. I always, the first one was Langston Hughes, uh, Daybreak in Alabama. And I always argue that uh, if Langston Hughes were alive, if Langston Hughes were born, uh, I suspect from 1969 to any point afterwards, uh, I think that he would, definitely have tried his hand at being an MC, uh, a rapper, and that he would have, rather he had bars and delivery, I have no doubt at all. In fact, I know probably no black male born in the United States from the late 1960s up who has not tried his hand at trying to rap, right? Everyone tried, even like people who are absolutely whack like me, you've tried to rap before, even if going through the lyrics of your favorite MC. Now, I cannot not imagine that Langston Hughes with his literary inclinations not trying to rap. But imagine if he was a brilliant rapper, a brilliant writer, right, as he was, but happened to also have fantastic del delivery. If he happened to have fantastic uh, um, charisma, if he happened to have the right connections and could in fact get into music, like will we still celebrate him in the same way? Will we think of Langston Hughes and study his, his poetry in the same way? Like will we sort of write books and think about him as a canonical contrib contrib contributor to literary um, uh, works. And we have the second person is, uh, some people probably know here, this is uh, someone from my hometown, someone from the LA area, from someone from Compton. I finished second grade and began, I, I finished first grade and began second grade at Compton uh, at Rose Prans Elementary School. And maybe it was where Kendrick Lamar went, but that's Kendrick Lamar, right? And so Kendrick Lamar has been celebrated by all sorts of uh, MCs and, uh, and rappers and other folks, but also people in the Ivory Tower in all sorts of ways. Uh, Kendrick Lamar himself is very conscious of the historical context out of which his art form emerges. He's very conscious of the fact that hip hop comes out of a particular social political milieu of despair, of marginalization, of, uh, of oppression, of codified forms of racial oppression, the consequence of hundreds of years of this uh, culminating in redlining and the South Bronx. So by the early 1970s, as, as the verge of hip hop uh, coming together, as Dr. Walton said here in 1973, we have the first hip hop organization called the Universal Zulu Nation in late 1973, where it comes together. And um, if in the five boroughs of New York City, the poorest borough was the Bronx. 
the poorest section of the Bronx was the South Bronx. And it was there in the South Bronx that you have youth who are economically uh, distraught in all sorts of ways. There are all, all these references in pop culture to the danger of the Bronx, the danger of black and brown youth in particular. There are movies and novels that talk about it. Uh, you have warriors, you have um, Fort Apache, you have people talking about youth and brought more broadly speaking in New York City, but the Bronx itself seems to embody much of these fears, a veritable set of barbarians at the gate of civilization. And in that space, uh, there are efforts by political organizations like the Black Panther Party and the, the Young Lords, a largely Puerto Rican revolutionary nationalist organization, to politicize the youth, to, to inspire the youth not to engage in the violence and destruction against their own communities, but to take that energy and channel into revolutionary activities for the benefit of these communities. And there are also nationalist organizations like the Nation of Islam that attempt to do so as well. Ultimately, there are young people who become uh, uh, affected, politically affected by these efforts. Some of them are uh, affected by these specific organizations. Other are affected by the general zeitgeist of black power. And they form groups that attempt to, in some ways, um, mitigate the self-destructive nihilism that we find in these communities. And one of those groups is uh, called the uh, Five Percenters. And the Five Percenters are an offshoot of the Nation of Islam. They target their activities towards young people and they emerged before the Black Power Movement, but they grew uh, exponentially during the Black Power Movement. And some of them decide to get together and uh, work with uh, young people to uh, channel some of these energies. A group of young people decide to do something that was not so tied to religion and they formed the Zulu Nation and saw four activities as actually, Although this is in the literature, they, it talks about three, uh, four activities or four pillars of hip hop. But there's a, there are actually three that are musically based and a fourth that gets added on later. But the first is the MC or, 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 or actually the DJ. And the DJ calls the parties. Uh, he needs someone to help him out. He gets an MC who becomes a rapper. So you have two elements of hip hop. The third, you have young guys and mostly males in crews dancing competing with each other, known as B-boys and B-girls uh, or break dancers. The etymology, there are controversies and conflicts over the etymology of this term, but you have B-boys, B-girls, rappers, and MCs. Those three elements come together uh, in 1973 with hip hop. Simultaneously, young people who are not connected to hip hop engage in graffiti art throughout New York City. Whites, Blacks, and uh, Latinos, primarily males, and they're not working class or poor, they actually have middle-class kids involved in this as well. That later gets fused into the four elements and becomes a fourth element of what we know as, uh, as hip hop culture. And this is how the Bronx looked in the early, at, at the time when hip hop was uh, being formed. We have, uh, as I mentioned before, we have the five different boroughs and we have that, we have urban decay, we have all sorts of things. These are some of the gangs we talk about. And now I wanna look at how these gangs, because they are being, they're from this moment here, this sort of, dystopian landscape. And let's look at how social movements emerge. So we now look at social movements. So sociologists and others who study social movements, political scientists, they have different discussions over how they rise and fall. But uh, I'm going to use a very popular framework here. And so if we imagine hip hop as a social movement, first let's define social movements. And there are four stages, emergence, followed by coalescence, third, bureaucratization, and fourth, decline. And what I want to do is look at how hip hop, anyone who really understands the history of hip hop will see that it follows these exact four uh, stages. And a social movement like the civil rights movement or the black power movement or a student anti-war movement with Vietnam when it, it emerges not out of a vacuum, but emerges to address, to address certain exigencies. So in the case of the civil rights movement is obvious, right? Black people are confronted. In the case of the modern civil rights movement, you have activities of people fighting against codified forms of racial oppression since those forms began, right? So we go all the way back to the beginning of those laws in the early part of the American Republic. We have people who are involved in slave resistance, all sorts of things, right? NACP is formed in 1909. But when we think about the modern civil rights movement, when we have the Montgomery bus boycott, we have certain conditions that are at play, including the recent uh, murder of Emmett Till. And we have an emergence of a grassroots movement addressing very specific challenges. 
And among those things, uh, people want to have the dismantling of the laws that keep people oppressed, preventing them from access to votes, to schools, to public accommodations, everything else. And in that effort, there's uh, in the emergence of this movement, we have a coalescence where organizations emerge and then like the um, uh, Montgomery Improvement Association, but then the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And then later we have another organization, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, aligning themselves with more um, mature organizations. And then we have this process of bureaucratization, right? Where you have a, a, a former struct, a formal structure and from a small organization of people in this small Southern town in Montgomery, ultimately those leaders are meeting with the most powerful people in the world, literally meeting with the president of the United States in the White House, meeting with uh, law enforcement, meeting with governors, meeting with people, corporate elites, uh, deci deciding policies, forcing the hand of local governments to hire people, to change laws, all these different things. And then after this process, there's a decline after certain successes have been achieved, right? So we have this, this rise, this coalescence, and then we have this decline. So what does this have to do with hip hop, right? We have success, organizational failure, co-option, repression, and establishment uh, with mainstream. So I want you to look at all those things there. And let's see if um, we can push through real fast. All right. Now let's look at what the issues, the, the conditions were to give rise to what we might know as a social movement for hip hop. So let's look at, you remember we talked about uh, what the Bronx looked like. There was probably, although everyone on this call is familiar with Compton, I suspect, everyone's familiar with Compton, California. I was born in Chicago, raised in Los Angeles. And when I say raised in LA, we, uh, my, my parents divorced and we lived in the South side of Chicago and we moved to Compton, California in, my first grade in 1976, December, actually 1975, we moved to California, settled in Compton in early 1976. And my mother never heard of Compton, except from a close friend of the family who owned some apartments there. And what, we, what my mother knew was that it was a suburb of Los Angeles. And LA seemed like a wonderful place. It was where Hollywood was, palm trees and uh, clear skies. My mother thought that this would be a fantastic, fun uh, experience for her in her uh, the last couple of years of the 20s, of her 20s, and trying to get into Hollywood. And Hollywood at the time was um, a process of black exploitation movies were in decline, but there were these opportunities for black actors in a way that they had never been in the history of Hollywood. And so my mother was hoping to get in that, that, um, that the industry at that time, but the doors were closing as she was trying to come in. But we went out there, went out, and people weren't really. Uh, most Americans had no idea what Compton was like before hip hop had come around to tell them what Compton was like. But we knew what the Bronx was like. We knew what uh, New York, we knew you knew what Harlem was like, and pop culture reminded us of the social ills and the problems, including all the things we mentioned here. And one of the things that, uh, when we think of what we know about the Bronx in the 1970s, and what we know about New York comes from, from most people, not from reading uh, scholarly articles on the causes of this, but reading things in the popular press or seeing movies. And the people who actually live there, them actually giving a voice to what they see around them, around them that was absent. And I ask my students oftentimes, when we talk about Reagan Reaganomics, we talk about the 1980s, and we talk about an unemployment rate for Afro-Americans uh, up in the 18%, 18.2%. That's, that's, that's actually depression era unemployment, right? So that's equivalent to what America itself experienced during the Great Depression. So we think about the 1980s. I asked my students, tell me some artists outside of hip hop, tell me some of their favorite artists from the 1980s, Black people. And they'll name, uh, you know, New Edition, Anita Baker, Luther Vandross, all these people that I love, right? Wonderful artists whom I love. And I'll say, how many of them were talking about what was going on at that time? How many of them talk about any of these issues we were studying? None of them, right? At the most, we have uh, Sign of the Times uh, with Prince, where he makes reference to um, um, man, dies with, man died with a big disease with a little name, talks about a boy in a gang called the Disciples, who was, you know, high on crack, told the machine gun. So he makes these two lines there, but if you could go through all the top 10 songs, uh, over the entire decade uh, from R&B artists, uh, one does not find uh, much social commentary, if any at all. Hip hop was very different. 
And hip hop actually made people familiar with these conditions. So those conditions were very intense, uh, homicide, drug trade, all these things here. I can go into great detail with all of those, but I'm, I'm assuming that you are familiar with those things. And out of that becomes the sort of, we go through the emergence period where people recognize there are certain fundamental problems that need to be addressed. Hip hop itself, when it came together, was not at its uh, earliest years about addressing these issues, despite, I know everything I've said right now makes it look like when they first got together, they started dropping lines about fighting the power. That actually didn't come out till later. So when hip hop first came together and they first started to put songs on wax, they actually were escapist songs. They were songs that built on uh, fantasy, pleasure, and uh, uh, joy, uh, joys of life. And they were braggadocious songs. They, there were songs that, um, when you think about the first song to ever get in the top 40 is uh, Rapper's Delight, and that's 1979. And earlier that year, King Tim the Third with a group called the Fat Back Band, a funk band, but they decided to put a rapper on a B-side. A B-side is the, um, they used to have these records and they would have the single that you purchased was the A-side. And then oftentimes groups would have on the B-side throwaway songs that did not make the album. And that was the B-side. Uh, so we actually have the first rap song coming out in 1979 and they're, I'm tall. I'm tall as I'm strong as an ox. I'm tall as a tree, and these sorts of songs, very much like Muhammad Ali's boastful rhymes that uh, he had. And so it wasn't at the earliest stages that people talked about these things, but it came around the 1980s. And when it, in the 1980s, you start to have rappers that talked about the the exigencies faced by them in communities. And one of the earliest examples would be Public Enemy, and Public Enemy was based in uh, based in New York from Long Island. And they adopted many of the iconography of the Black Power movement. And Chuck D, the leading rapper, the head rapper in 1988, uh, he came out the same year that NWA's um, Shred of Compton came out. It was uh, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back was the name of Public Enemy's second album that came out in 88. And they were very, very clear that they anchored themselves in a radical Black tradition, what Robin Kelly would call a radical Black tradition, a sort of envisioning of the, the, a radical envision of the possibilities of their struggle, of their social movement. And he would name check all sorts of people from Sada Shakur, who was known as her, her birth name, Joanne Ch Chesamard, I'm loud and proud like Chesamard. He made references all the way back to slavery. I'm like Nat, it's like that, leave me the hell alone. If you don't think I'm a brother, then check my chromosomes, Mandela. Sell Dweller, Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain, Thatcher, you could tell her, clear the way for the prophets of rage. And so in this song, he's going on and anchoring himself in a radical tradition all the way back to Nat Turner, right? And like Bessie or Prosser, I have a reason why, to debate the hate, that's why we're born to die. And so he says all these things, and for many people who are unaccustomed to this, people who have never read any of these books, people who have never gone to, to lectures of Farrakhan or never gone to John Henry Clark's uh, talks, who had never heard Ashwa Kwesi, who had never heard some of these figures, um, they got a chance to hear a lot of this stuff. And people who are not even reading the books and people in high school were hearing names they had never heard for the first time. And the people were sort of fascinated by this. And I've met people who said that the very first time they heard Malcolm X's voice was in a Public Enemy album when they sampled him. Too Black, too strong. And so you heard these things uh, through hip hop. And so black nationalism itself became this sort of way for people to, to coalesce, right? We think about the coalescence stage, right? And so people were debating this. And when Public Enemy talked about what was going on, they not just talked about the, the conditions under which black people languished, but they also anchored themselves in a way to address them. They talked about prison industrial complex. They have, their, their album, they're actually behind bars, standing on American flag. Uh, Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos. There, he's put in prison and he escapes because of his his uh, his radical crew. The S1Ws liberate him from prison, right? Like Joanne uh, Chesomar, like Asada Shakur. Um, when he talks about they're tapping his phone, they're not tapping his phone because he's selling crack, right? So when Biggie, I know a lot of people love Biggie, but when Biggie says they're tapping my phone because I'm flagrant, um, they're not tapping his phone because he's a radical revolutionary trying to free black people. They're tapping his phone because he's selling crack to black people, right? He's killing, he's actually literally says, I make ninjas bleed, right? So they're tapping his phone for very different reasons that they're tapping Chuck D's phone. He says, they're tapping my phone, they won't leave me alone. I'm even lethal when I'm unarmed because I'm louder than a bomb, right? He, again, anchors himself in this uh, this radical tradition. To so go back to all the people that he, he, he name checks, he says, 
Uh, this party started right in 66 with pro-black radical mix. Then at the hour of 12, some force caught the power and emerged from the hell. So he says this, power, this party started right in 66. The Black Panther Party started in 1966. And some force emerged from, cut the power off and emerged from hell. He talks about repression, right? Jagger Hoover, that stinking sucker, he had both King and X set up. So when he talks about this, he's giving you a history of force in this. So we have this coalescence, the rise of various organizations. We have the iconography that continues to circulate in hip hop. And then this period we have, um, I apologize if I gone to the slide earlier, this is the emergent stage of hip hop. If hip hop is seen as a social movement, this is emergent stage, little or no organization, widespread discontent, the increased media coverage of ne negative conditions, crack cocaine scourge, increasing violence, homicide, poverty, and we have the message in 1982, right? And this, the message actually is a song and the video is really powerful. People should check out the video. They actually go to, uh, it's filmed on location in New York. You see all sorts of malaise and problems in, in urban spaces. And the, the lyrics talk about how terrible things are. And this is a coalescent stage, right? This is a popular stage of any social movement. This content is no longer uncoordinated individual. It tends to become focalized and collected. Leadership starts to emerge. Right here, we have King of Rock, uh, this is a stage in which the movement becomes more than just random upset individuals. At this point, they are now organized and strategic in their outlook. And we get a chance to see this in the, the uh, development of the Stop the Violence Movement in 1988. And the self-destruction, systematically addressing the violence that people see in their communities, not just individuals uncoordinated, but actually people come together. All the popular West uh, East Coast rappers came together to stop the violence movement. And so, simultaneously in the West Coast, there was, uh, we're all in the same gang song that emerged uh, as well, bringing together all the hottest rappers from the West Coast. We also have a stylistic difference that people start to identify with. Uh, the fashion made them distinct from other youth and also, of course, other entertainers. And it was something distinct about hip hop style that was very different from what we saw in earlier rap rappers that actually looked like funk bands, looked like the village people and others. So if you see early rappers, my students are very surprised to see Africa, Bambada, and the Soul Sonic Force, or uh, Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five, they would have, you know, tight leather pants, uh, high heel pumps, uh, feather, you know, scarves and things like that, and very, very different than what you would see uh, by the time hip hop comes uh, around here. Now, let's look at the, the, the so-called, um, the formalization in this stage, and this is very important. So in this stage where hip hop, in 1988, we have two seminal albums that come out, we have Fight the Power. We have um, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back by Public Enemy. We have on the West Coast, a Strata Compton by NWA. Both offer uh, an anti authoritarianism style. Both have an urban black male cool. Both are counter hegemonic in different ways. Um, one group celebrates its anti status positions. Its, anti-establishment positions by lauding revolutionary Black traditions. One anchors itself in gangster narratives of nihilism, where, and, and my students often think that NWA is more like public enemy than it actually was. NWA was very clearly mis misogynistic, referred to women as B's and H's in ways that people had not seen before, but also celebrated killing Black people. And there was no question about that. Uh, Easy E's is F a car. I do a mother F and walk by and the cel celebrating killing people. They ask like they ask him in the line, what about the girl that got shot? He says, F her. You think I give a damn about a B? I'm not a sucker. So he's very clear. I don't care about black girls. I don't care about black people. And uh, Ice Cube says, I have a body count like Charles Manson. And, he, you know, there's a celebration of their gangster bravado. And while they say F the police, people think, oh, they said F the police. You know, Professor Ogbar say must be pro-black. I'm like, well, I suspect if you took Al Capone or Charles Manson and asked them, how do you feel about the police? I think they would be like, what the police? You know, because I'm thinking, you know, you're trying to stop me from killing people and doing stuff I like to do, right? So just because you're anti-police doesn't necessarily mean you're pro-Black, right? So people have to kind of disentangle uh, this, this idea. So when we think about these two groups that come out in 1988, you have two groups that are very popular. Simultaneously, hip hop is going past the, the, the confines of Black communities all out into America. And young white people listening to hip hop. The party music that had typified hip hop was still going on at this time, but also you have a, a, a very contentious point when people are attacking party rappers for being 
vapid, for being hollow bubblegum rappers. So someone like Fresh Prince and DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, that some of these people who were wildly popular, Heavy D and, and even Rakim was not, as much as people love Rakim, Rakim um, lyrically was not a, a conscious MC, although I used to even argue that he was a conscious MC, that someone forced me, like name some of his conscious songs. I started itching and scratching and stuttering. I was like, well, uh, well, his name was Rakim, so that, you know, it didn't really go too far, right? But Rakim, like many others, like Big Daddy Kane, they were braggadocious rappers, not necessarily talking, not part of the radical Black tradition, but part of the, the hip-hop tradition of cool, of bravado, of celebrating their own agility on the microphone, and also just being party rappers, right? Uh, it became very difficult to just be a party rapper, and, and by the way, Rakim didn't curse, which you know, Rakim is beloved by the most grimy, you know, hood, you know, dudes and, you know, people who are gospel folks who would never use a profane word in their life. Everyone loved Rakim. And, uh, but it became, it became very difficult for someone to be a party rapper and not curse and not be one of those camps of the radicals or the gangsters by the early 1990s, primarily a consequence of the blowback from two major rappers that uh, came out, MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice had become really big at this time. And it, it was difficult for rappers. The market coalesced, they were, they were bureaucratized, uh, bureaucratized at this time, and there were institutions that were created and a systematic marginalization of more radical voices. Uh, we have this formalization stage characterized by quote, higher levels of organization and coalition-based strategies. In this stage, social movements have had success in that they raise awareness to a degree that is coordinated strategies necessary across all of the social movement organizations. There's print media, the, in this period, the source actually was founded. Uh, the source came about in 1988. Uh, visual media, in this point, we have Rap City and UMC Raps come out in this period. Mainstream music, this is a, in this period, and just in this small two year period, the Grammys recognized hip hop for the very first time as well. And across the country, radio uh, recognizes uh, hip hop and play hip hop. So hip hop it becomes formalized in this period. This two year window, all of those things happen. Uh, these are some of the things we think about the uh, the media that emerged, uh, the Source magazine. This is Public Enemy right here, uh, taking some of the aesthetics from the Black Panther Party. Uh, at the same time, when we have hip hop coalescing, we think about student movement, student newspapers across the United States uh, talked about the, the conditions in which uh, Black communities uh, language much the way they did in the late 1960s, 20 years earlier. We find I was a student writer, I was a history editor of the newspaper at Morehouse College. We used to share newspapers with students all across the United States and we would see radical articles. It's really amazing. There should be an entire uh, study done on this. It's been overlooked. And, uh, and we're about that that's at that stage where people can write about some of these things. I had a, a series, um, I don't know if I should say it now, but it was uh, it was wild. I, I don't even wanna say it right now, but it was real intense. It was real crazy. But I, I, I had a, uh, <laughs> and now people will look it up. Well, I was a writer and I did all kinds of things. All right, check this out. So we have, Howard University, Morehouse, Hampton, uh, U UM Amherst, uh, Georgia State, UCLA. These are places where there were student protests and takeovers of buildings by black students in this period. And these students, if you took it, if you look at pictures of those black students uh, at U UMass Amherst, there's a white school, uh, majority white school, or Georgia State or UCLA, or the black schools there, you will see the students wearing African medallions and having African uh, print clothes, all sorts of super black things in this period. And we saw them in many ways uh, reflecting the, the movement itself. And then we go to the last stage here, decline. And this is not necessarily failure, but a possible consequence of institutionalization. One or more of these factors can explain decline. Co-option, repression. We think about repression. Um, there were, in the history of the United States of America, no album had ever been banned, period. Until hip hop came around. And it was a real vulgar album, as nasty as we want to be, by Two Live Crew in Florida. And it was banned, it was overturned. There were congressional hearings on hip hop. Um, we also have people who were sued. We had uh, Tupac, there was a, a Texas state trooper was shot by a, a man and the man happened to have Tupac in his, keep in mind that millions of people had Tupac cassette tapes. It turned out that this dude had a, a Tupac cassette tape and they argued that Tupac's lyrics inspired this dude to shoot this state trooper. And I had Tupac cassette tape. I never shot anybody, like millions of other people, but there were actually uh, efforts to ban Tupac. 
there was a rapper named Paris out of California who had a song called Bush Killer, and he was dropped by his label. Ice-T, the famous actor, rapper, had a rock group called Body Count, and time after a police protest, he was dropped from Time Warner. There were unprecedented protests against rappers who had, in fact, been critical of the police. Videos were banned. Public Enemy had a video called By the Time I Get to Arizona. It was banned by MTV. The rapper Ice Cube, a completely different man from Ice-T, also from L.A., he was attacked by Billboard magazine's editor in an unprecedented move. In the history of music, all sorts of vulgarities have been expressed by musicians of all sorts. Guns N' Roses actually had a white group, had a line where they said they didn't want ninjas selling them gold chains. But the Billboard editor said nothing, right? There are all sorts of songs where Black rappers talked about killing Black people. Snoop had a line where he says, rat tat tat and a tat like that. I never hesitate to put a ninja on his back. There are all sorts of songs that were misogynistic. NWA has a song where they intimated raping a woman. They went into a bank and they wanted to rape her and they pulled down her pants and found that she was a man, that the person was a male. And so there were all these songs that come out that were wildly vulgar, wildly offensive, but Billboard said nothing until Ice Cube came up, right? We said something about white people. And so at this point, there was an unprecedented stage of repression and many labels found that if they wanted to have success to access to radio they would have access to videos they want to have uh, print coverage that if you had to be anti-authoritarian those two examples i gave you guys earlier right that the black radical part like paris and all these people talking about corrupt police officers if you and you see the video by the time i get to arizona they're not killing random people in the video they're very clear that they're going after white supremacists. But if you were going to talk about killing someone, that you could not talk about killing representatives of the state, right? That if you're going to do so, you can kill Black people. And this became part of the, uh, the, the, the process of decline. And uh, in this, we also have uh, repression, success, and failure. So it's not necessarily all about uh, the repression. It's also about uh, particular successes that people have. A lot of videos here that we don't have enough time to get into, but examples of some of the songs that I made references to here. Um, we also have uh, efforts at uh, co-option, where there were other videos that talked about uh, the drug trade uh, in a what we call a cautionary tale, where you say there is a drug tr trade with dire consequences, and there was a shift in the gaze from a drug trade with dire consequences to a drug trade that could get you a whole bunch of money and wealth and women, right? And so this without any commentary on the deleterious consequences of that trade. We also have the co-option of some of the iconography, right? So we have uh, right here, literally a rapper takes uh, Malcolm X, who was talking about freeing black people again, and do by any means necessary, um, a man literally is like trap or die, you know, by any means necessary, sell crack or die, right? And we have other people who have taken the same, uh, who've seen themselves as ideological heirs of Malcolm X, like these two MCs, who are not talking about that. We have people uh, who've made references to uh, Black nationalist leaders in all sorts of different ways. There, my, my, my hip hop book actually takes off of this as well. There's a, DJ Lord has a turntable instead of a gun as his weapon of choice on the cover of my book. And, but you have a whole bunch of rappers and others who uh, signify Malcolm X. Uh, where he has the assault rifle, liberate your minds, with by all means necessary, with Boogie Down Productions, this is Karis One. And we have lyrically a whole bunch of people making reference to Malcolm. Here's one from uh, 50 Cent, like Malcolm by any means, with my gun in my palm. Uh, we have people who made reference to the Black Panthers in so many different ways. In addition to the S1Ws, we have Nas right here with Huey Newton. Uh, right here, we have Shine co opting, and we have Nicki Minaj with an album, a horrible, horrible song, an album where Malcolm X's family was appalled. And she actually um, changed her album cover, but then disrespected Malcolm's daughters who criticized her. Uh, where in the video, she's actually talking about killing black people, ninjas. And she's a dude with a gun and shooting and stuff and calling black people looking as ninjas. Um, and then we have uh, people that we don't have a lot of time right here to think about the social movement and a sort of reemergence of that, looking at the, the next stage of it. And I'll, I'll conclude by saying that in the most recent years we've had with the with Black Lives Matter movement, 
all the same conditions or not necessarily all the same, but we have many of the same conditions that were that were stressors that fomented the, uh, the social movement in its first stage in hip hop. And I would argue that we've seen a lot of that with in the most recent years with an entirely new generation. And that is not as, um, as clear cut aesthetically as other generations, but we can look at violence as a, uh, a progenitor of these social movements. And right here, we have Chicago. We're actually, where people have talked about Chicago, Southside Chicago in particular, is Chirac. Chicago is Chirac. But if you actually look at Iraq, you were safer in Iraq. So US soldiers, studies have found that US soldiers were safer in Iraq than black people were on the Southside of Chicago. And keep in mind that these are numbers for the entirety of Chicago, including all the west side and the north side. Just looking at the south side alone, with this million of, of inhabitants, the rate, of course, jumps up uh, exponentially. Again, higher than what we find in other places. We, um, the icons of Black power manifest in all sorts of ways. Uh, these are some examples of, uh, of repression, of success. We have extreme sales and success that have come out of hip hop. So hip hop has ge generated more financial success than any genre of music, period. Uh, people are always surprised when I say the very first musician to become a billionaire uh, was not a white person. It was uh, Jay-Z. And Jay-Z, people are surprised when I say that. People are like, what about this person? But uh, no, not that person either. And so uh, success in hip hop, the multiple um, um, billionaires now, but also you have uh, extreme wealth and access to uh, creative spaces that did not exist before on this scale, including fashion and magazines and movies and other uh, creative spaces. Uh, I don't think that anyone, you know, when when even when Dr. King uh, gave his speech on uh, jazz, I'm not sure he would imagine that someone signifying a black power fist in Times Square, who is almost worth a billion dollars, uh, who had dropped out of college, that this would be uh, something that he would see in his that ever, right? Uh, and these are some old pictures. This is Kanye looking uh, not as uh, unstable as he is now. But you see some of the the some of the, the wealthiest and the the uh, fruits of the success that hip hop has had. There are magazines that have been um, that have centered some of this attention on black success in the hip hop, and in so many different spaces. This is uh, it's fascinating to read, but there's also the criticism of the menstrual archetypes that have continued. One of the things that we see as hip hop is, uh, if we imagine as a city, which is quite diverse we find that its inhabitants, of course, would be uh, quite diverse, uh, living in different spaces, saying different things, and uh, doing different things. Um, Fly Anakin and uh, Cy Rock are two contemporary MCs uh, who have come out in the last few years, who come out with albums. They both have, they're incredibly rich. I would say they come out of the same sort of tradition, the radical Black tradition, uh, while this would be less so, and with this is future and a lot of. I think that they, um, we find the contested spaces of hip hop right here. And I think that we continue to see hip hop's um, uh, social movement uh, ebb and flow in the Black Lives Matter movement that we see right now. And I'll conclude by saying that as pessimistic as sometimes I might be about hip hop, that there has been no example of a movement as, um, as impressive with the size as what we saw in the summer of 2020. And we're in the special conditions there. But uh, after George Floyd, there had never been any point in United States history where as many cities, and as many people on as many streets as we did uh, at that time. And uh, young people have been involved in a way that I've never seen and no one has ever seen, not even the civil rights movement um, as we've seen under uh, Black Lives Matter. And so there's a lot of space to be hopeful. And even when most of the adherents to hip hop might not be advocates of Black Lives Matter, I have quotes from a whole bunch of MCs who were like, Lil Wayne and you know um, some others who've been like critical, ASAP Rocky and folks who've been hostile to hip hop, hostile to Black Lives Matter. A whole bunch of folks, including white ones, have been uh, and mainstream rappers from J. Cole all the way through, uh, who have been um, uh, Ti and a whole bunch of folks who've been like deeply involved in, in Black Lives Matter in all sorts of ways. So hip hop continues to be diverse. Uh, the, the possibilities of it as a social movement continue to manifest itself, and uh, and we will see where hip hop goes uh, from here. And as to quote. Uh, uh, most deaf, you know, people talk about hip hop like it's a giant living mountain somewhere, but uh, hip hop is us and we are hip hop. So where we go, hip hop goes. Indeed, indeed. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very, very, very much.
Oh, uh, so those who are listening, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Uh, and then I'll read the question and Dr. Obar will respond. Uh, I want to first say uh, thank you for that overview. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, you added some new things that uh, I didn't even discuss in my history of hip hop course. Uh, so thank you very, very much for that. And I want to say uh, I was one of those kids in Detroit, Michigan, right outside of Detroit, Michigan, where I actually stopped gang banging because of hip hop. Uh, I was born in 75, so this was 1991, I was 16. And it was because of two rap artists, uh, two albums in particular. One was Ice Cube's Death Certificate, and the other was Tupac's Tupacalypse Now. Uh, and I began reading Malcolm X speeches and buying the cassettes. Y'all young people may not know what a cassette is, but it was a time where you could go to black bookstores uh, go to black festivals like the African World Festival in uh, in Detroit or to the Shrine of the Black Madonna, uh, the Pan-African uh, Church of the Shrine of the Black Madonna in Detroit. Now also in Atlanta, they had a bookstore. So we buy cassette tapes of uh, Malcolm X giving speeches. Uh, and I began reading uh, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale uh, as a result back when uh, those books were in my high school library, believe it or not. And it wasn't a majority black city at the time, but of Romulus, Michigan. Uh, and I explained to people how, how different things seem to me uh, now where we're seeing so many people are influenced uh, to get involved in gang culture. Uh, through hip hop or people will say because of hip hop. And then I look at myself and say, I got out of it mm. as a result of hip hop and briefly joined the Nation of Islam and studied under Rasul Muhammad for a couple years. So I say all that to say, Dr. Obar, today with the Chicago drill scene, Black Gangster Disciples, Gangster Disciples, uh, and then in Atlanta with uh, blood gangs uh, and crib gangs coming out of Savannah. So YSL, which is a blood gang, Young Thug is facing Rico. Uh, it seems way more intense than in the 90s with Bloods and Crips out of Los Angeles. Uh, do you see that as a a shift in hip hop or representative of the ebb and flow and perhaps old people like myself we're being too hard and maybe blaming hip hop too much mm. uh, so and when i wrote hip hop revolution i i believe that hip hop influenced its listeners stories like yours and I remember, as I mentioned in my talk, I've, I've met people who said they never heard Malcolm's voice before in some public And, and uh, a lot of people who had, you know, I, I didn't know Joanne Chesomar when he said loud and proud like Chesomar. I had no idea who he was talking about. I, I was deeply, I was deep in that space, right? So I I didn't know who Chesomar was. And so um, I think that I don't, okay, so my point is that I used to think that hip hop really affected people's behavior. What I found is that on a macro level, it does not seem to be the case. When I look at um, crime rates, for example, I have an entire chapter, as you know, on chapter four, um, chapter four looks at, at the cultural wars and the debate that hip hop is a fact of social danger. And I look at it as, as hip hop became you know, more anti-black and became more anti-social, became more anti-woman, the uh, the polls, the studies, the crime rates, the level of black death, all these things are decreased. In fact, black people graduating high school at record rates. We graduate high school, college, graduate school at higher rates than when people are listening to uh, not before hip hop emerged. And and these things may have happened outside of hip hop. And, and also historically, as I mentioned before, there were congressional hearings on rock and roll music and people uh, systematically organized against jazz because people thought that those two genres of music were fundamental threats to America's youth. 
But we find that uh, American youth who listen to jazz uh, excelled in many measures, pretty much by every measure, uh, with their parent generation. And then the same thing for rock and roll. And we see that with hip hop as well. So I think that there that music is too small of a factor in people's lives to become that much of a uh, motivator and whether they're gonna you know, use a condom or not um, on a macro scale. And we found that that for the group that, while all groups listen to hip hop, whites, blacks, Asians, Latino, well, whites, blacks, and Latinos, the youth all listen to hip hop. The group that listen to hip hop at the highest rate within the group is African-American, like 90 some odd percent of African-American youth listen to hip hop. And for males, like 97% that when they, they listen to hip hop, that they black males are the most likely to endorse gender equality than all males, right? Among white, black, and Latino males in multiple studies over multiple years. And so people are always surprised that hip hop would be so wildly misogynistic in its commercial forms, but those who are most likely to consume it are the ones who are most likely to endorse uh, gender equality. And on so many, doesn't mean they're not sexist, right? But they're, they're less, than whites and Latinos in all these studies that have been done. I talk about that in the book as well. So, so I do think that um, there are other factors at play. Finally, we think about the proliferation of, of gangs in different cities. I mean, Ice Cube has a great song, My Summer Vacation, off of that album that you love. And I love that album too. I wore it out, right? Just yeah. I, love, I could probably do every lyric. You see, I was going off with the public enemy, right? So I could, but he, when he talks about going to, uh, to St. Louis, right? And he talks about a phenomenon that happened not had nothing to do with hip hop, right? When it, when he was going out to St. Louis, setting up shop, and then had people dying for a street they never heard of, that had nothing to do with hip hop. But he was documenting it. In, he was documenting it in hip hop. So I think that if there's a causation, there are. I, I, I stutter and I pause here because I I do not believe that hip hop has no influence on anyone, right? And I know that I I just cannot believe that. If I'm a young kid trying to be cool and my favorite MC is talking about how wonderful and great it is to sell crack and how I'm reading about how he used to sell crack. And then my man Future is like, hey, young ninja, go and move that dope. Move that dope. Move that dope. It's good. I love selling. And everyone's talking about how wonderful it is, how fun it is. And you got my man, he's like, I'm in love with the cocoa. And he's like, and everyone's talking about how wonderful it is. About That's all I hear. And I, if I'm in a space where I see somebody doing it, I don't know if I, as a 12, me, I don't know about everybody else, but me, as because I was like you, I was, I had a foot in the streets. I was probably less than you, but I had a foot in the streets. And, and, and I, I cannot imagine that I, would, that I wouldn't have, I don't know. I, I just, I can't trust it. I would not have been curious and will try my hand at something. And I have another friend that said that, uh, I, you know, I was I was young, I smoked weed, but it had nothing to do with hip hop. But I, when I did all that stuff, I had weed and 40 ounces and wrote my name on the wall and thought I was a gangster. I was hanging with dudes before gangster rap ever emerged. So I was doing all the stuff that gangster rappers would later talk about, but I, I was doing it because of hip hop. Uh, but I did have a friend who said that he never smoked weed because he read that his favorite artist was Michael Jackson, never ever such drugs. And he was like, Michael Jackson never touched drugs. I'll never touch drugs. And so that was his thing. So I, I I can't deny that music does affect some pe some people in their behavior. I know it's a long, long. I promise my next answer will be very short and simple. Oh well, that was a great answer. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Someone from the Q and A, a gentleman I went to undergrad with, and he was involved with me in our uh, Black Consciousness and Black Power student movement. Uh, through the Black Student Union and the SOAAU, which was the student organization for African American unity, we basically bit Malcolm X's organization's name. Uh, and he, and he's an educator now uh, from Flint, Michigan. And he asked, "Can you share your views on the use of hip hop in the modern classroom to facilitate dialogue?" Yeah, you know, I find that hip hop is because virtually all youth listen to it. It is a, um, it's a way to start all sorts of conversations because people have an opinion about rap. I, I, had, a, I had a cousin down in Memphis who I was down visiting family and we went to make a run together once. And I just met the guy, he was 19, he was reticent. I'm a grown man. I'm trying to get a conversation with him and he was just giving me yes or no answers. Asked him, you know, whose favorite MC was. All of a sudden, he opened up, right? And it was 
Southern rap that I was listening to, but still he opened up and he had all these opinions. And I found that I, I typically found that young people, um, that music is a is a particular space where uh, is a sonic backdrop to their lives. They have their favorite artists, people that they invest their time in. When they're alone, they're listening to these people and they have their opinions. And it becomes a wonderful way, a, a, a jumping point, I think, for a lot of conversations because MCs, studies have shown that rap music, they have the biggest vocabularies of any form of pop music. And so they talk about a lot of stuff. And I'm sure there's some some gateway for broader conversations to be had. Indeed, indeed. Now I want to pivot a bit. Uh, in your book, you use the concept of Afrocentric rap. And some of the songs that you listed are from Afrocentric rappers like X-Clan. I used to love X-Clan from Detroit. X Clan sampled a lot of the Parliament Funkadelics mm -hmm. and the funk from Oakland, like Bootsy Collins and those guys. We loved it. We still dance. We would dance to it. <clears throat> it wasn't until I went to the university and became a Black Studies major that I understood at least half of what <laughs> Brother Jay and them were talking about in those songs. But then I think of Afrocentric uh, acts like you know the Native Tongues Collective with the Jungle Brothers, Tribe Called Quest, uh, and De La Soul, even Black Sheep to a lesser degree, but including in Moni Love and others. Uh, do do you feel optimistic that we can see a re a renaissance of Afrocentric rap, or is it still out there and maybe my lens doesn't allow me to see it for what it is? Yeah, so uh, Sarak, who I just had on the screen for the last, you know, maybe you know, ten minutes, uh, she has a song forever. It's a beautiful song, lyrically very, very rich, and uh, you know, she in many ways represents. That may be her biggest hit. I'm not sure, uh, but she does. She comes out of that tradition, right? and she name checks a lot of people from, you know, our era, and. Um, the other guy, uh, Fly Anakin, he, he has a really rich video where he makes reference to some, some folks from back in the day as well. But, you know, I, I do quote Angela Davis here. Or I don't know if it's Angela Davis who said it first, but she certainly made reference to it before. But, you know, every generation needs to find its own. And Franz Fanon also talks about this. Like, every generation needs to find its own sort of, you know, direction and call it, I would say, aesthetics as well, right? I know that um, when I was an undergrad and, you know, I brought dashikis at times and, uh, I, I, you know, certainly saw myself as being an heir to what people had done in the Black Power movement earlier. Uh, but I, I do notice that people who are involved in a lot of stuff like activists now have their own aesthetics that don't look like Black Power or in the early 90s uh, stuff. And I think that that makes perfect sense. And, but, you know, as you know, you can be officers in other ways. It doesn't have to be just in dress. And so, um, yeah, I, the the la, uh, quick quick thing about broadening our understanding of Afrocentricity beyond the sort of aesthetics is that I do believe that for cer certain circles of creative expression, if we look at Luke Cage as a as a show, Luke Cage, I think it was a, a Netflix show. Luke Cage, there is the whole first season. It was very Afrocentric, right? In in a way that I think people overlook, but. And, and each episode was after a Black song, right? It was uh, the whole season I think they did. It might have been like uh, P-Rock and Seal Smooth or the second season, one of them. And then they not only did they do that, but they had one episode where they made every uh, references to like Shirley Chisholm, um, Jack Johnson, Bessie Smith, the aviator. Um, they made references to so many icons of the Black experience. And it just was done leisurely and they way they kind of inserted it, it was just such an organic thing. But it mm -hmm. was, and then of course it's set in Harlem. And in so many ways, it's like one of the most Afrocentric things you've ever seen, right? With no African clothes anywhere. And they pulled from African American artistic just uh spaces across media and such with such a plum. It was just done so well, and it was a such a sophisticated examination of you know basic universal human stories of conflict, but couched in something that was unmistakably very Afrocentric. So I think in many ways it might be right before our faces. I know that's not rap music, but 
you know, if you ever see Luke Cage, they're making reference to rap all the time. Again, the whole second season or first season, they they use rappers uh, to, to for every single episode's title, right? And there's a scene where he stands under a Biggie crown and big picture of Biggie in the back, you know. Yeah. So hip hop suffuses the uh, the the show itself. Indeed, 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 and you know, and we are seeing uh, some of those aesthetics uh, in some ways. Uh, even if they may not be conscious rappers, you know, like locks, you know, is a big thing in hip hop now. I would argue Lil Wayne might have helped usher it in to be so universally accepted. Uh, although people like Brand Nubian and Das Effects and them had done it prior, but it, it, it didn't become as popular, you know, it sees. And even Jay Z doing his best Basquiat. Basquiat impression <laughs> uh, uh, I find interesting. Now, one of my former students from Eastern Michigan University in Black Studies from many years ago, who is now soon to be a PhD in Black Studies out of Temple, if he hurry up and finishes his dissertation, uh, he asked, uh, what are your thoughts on hip hop and uh, specifically drill or trap music being promoted as the baseline of black culture and popular society. Is hip hop appropriately positioned as the central explanation of African-American culture to the global society? Hmm. That's a great question. So we all know, not we all, I just learned this term some years ago, uh, confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is this uh, tendency that humans have to see what they want to see and dismiss things that don't conform to what they want to see, right? So an example, I was giving a talk one time and I was talking about the history of minstrelsy and this uh, a white gentleman came up after the talk and said, uh, why is it the majority of black people walk around sagging with the drawers hanging out? I explained to him that's, that's not the majority. He said, no, that's what I see. I said, nope, that's not what you see. He said, no, oh, when I go to New Haven, I said, nope, when you go to New Haven, you don't, don't see it. So I just broke down the numbers. I said, well, you know, half of black people are women and women are walking around with drawers hanging out. You would admit that. So that leaves 50%. And then you would admit that 100% of the black men aren't doing that, black males. So you probably have to go with people who are probably, say, the ages of 10 to, I don't know, maybe 40, right? And then that's not even, you know, that's a, a much smaller number. Then even then, I don't think you would admit that all of them from 10 to 40 walking around the drawers hanging out, right? And so what you probably see, you might see 15 black people at the bus stop. You see one dude walking around with drawers hanging out, but like, that's a white, that's a black dude walking around these draws hanging out. And confirmation bias allows us to see a lot of things that people don't see. And I think that when it comes to how people view black people, like globally, how people view black folks. And I find that people might look at um, at hip hop and say, all right, Chief Keef or someone else from Chicago that, you know, King Von or what I used to use, I don't know where King Von's from, maybe he's from Chicago, maybe he's from somewhere else. But that these dudes represent what black people are about. But the thing is that if anyone, if you took that like a systematic effort and a pen and paper to write down every time you saw a black person in pop culture, I literally would say that probably 89% of the time, maybe even 93% of the time, black people are middle class, right? Like I, I could watch I could watch the string commercials and see from mouthwash to uh, you know, Medicaid to like with the you know, skin rashes and stuff. Uh, black people, right? And they're middle class folks. I could watch every major news network show in the morning. They all have black newscasters, except, except for Fox News. So just watching the news, you're going to see black people at all time at all the networks, unless you only watch Fox News. And every space you see, every TV show, every movie, any workplace drama, whether it's a cop show or a lawyer show, there are black members of the cast and they're capable middle class professional black folks. So, so people may choose to think that King Von is the only thing they see, but the fact of the matter is that he represents probably a single digit percentage of all the black images that anyone sees at any given time in the course of a week. A confirmation bias amplifies him, you know, makes him, of course, the sort of representation, but it's not because it is because people want him to be. And that speaks more about people's own problematic, toxic assumptions about black people rather than what they actually see. Indeed, and I totally agree. Uh, and yep, King Von is from Chicago South Side. He's actually from the same neighborhood that Michelle Obama was mm. raised in. The obviously the neighborhoods, uh, its socioeconomic status has changed greatly since <laughs> Michelle Robinson <laughs> grew up there. But indeed, now, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Uh, something that I've noticed, and it's going back to positive impact, or some people would see it. I see it as a positive impact. People that sometimes make me cringe, like Dr. Umar Johnson may not see it as a positive thing, but how this generation of hip hop has pushed uh, the acceptability of uh, of black queer uh, people, particularly, you know, black queer young people. Uh, it's, it's more acceptable now. Uh, and uh, what do you think about that progress or strand of progress, uh, progressiveness in hip hop? Yeah, well, you know, I think love is good, right? I think that um, that love is a beautiful thing. If people can find love, you know, uh, healthy love to themselves as adults, that's that's great. You know, so that, that's wonderful. And it's, it's good to see hip hop make that progress. What's, what's conspicuous is that while we do not see, we've actually seen a decline in, you know, homophobic language, right? F words and things like that. We have seen no decline at all in anti-woman language. So, I mean, it's, it's a kind of conspicuous to me that hip hop could all of a sudden become kind of more tolerant in this one particular space, but remain really, and, and it's to a point now, like calling women B's and H's and is normative. It's unique in hip hop, I and mean, you don't hear it in R, you don't hear it in R and B or country or gospel or soul music or you know whatever jazz lyrics that you hear. And certainly in all black creative expressions up to hip hop, you didn't hear it. And so the interesting thing is that you have this uh, sort of unique space where, you know, you have, you know, I will take your B, I will do this, you know, your B did this and my that, you know, it is like, it's all this sort of thing that yes. is, is conspicuous that people can become elevated in that, that way, but remain coarse and vulgar and misogynistic. Uh, in these other spaces, let alone the anti-black stuff. I mean, the, the celebration of killing ninjas is, uh, that's like the, the the oil that greases the machines of commercial hip hop. And I do find it fascinating, you know, and I wish that hip hop could be, because I don't think people think, I don't know, I mean, I'm not really talking, to, I mean, I talk to my students, they kind of keep me informed on some things, but um, I don't I don't hear my students, again, I might have more enlightened students and they're more tolerant, and I, I suspect, and they're, or if they are homophobic, they might not be willing to be so open about it. But um, and hostile to like Lil Nas X or some others. But you know, I think about um, like Tyler the Creator and a whole bunch of other people who have sort of like you know Young and May and a whole bunch of people who just kind of like expanded the boundaries of what we you know back in the day there were rumors that Queen Latifah was, and when they asked her, she was like, "I'm not saying I'm you know I'm, I'm be quiet." And it was like nobody was, you know, nobody was ever saying anything about uh, what they, if they were uh, LGBTQ. But then also you have people who were openly misogynistic and it was just a very kind of, com I'm excuse me, that and openly homophobic. And so it was a very common trope in, uh, in, in hip hop. And even, you know, it's kind of fascinating to hear, hear songs now that were very popular back in the day and uh, realize just how, you know, just how, how backward things were. So, you know, good to see progress, but I'm always surprised that people are not willing to make the same progress in other spaces. And it seems like it's gotten worse. And just, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, but I know this is, I'm, I'm here visiting your class. I'll, I'll leave that to next time. No, indeed. Uh, for me, though, um, and some of my students noticed it last semester in my History of Hip Hop course, <clears throat> I'm, I'm still trying to sort out uh, the misogyny or the performance of toxic masculinity by uh, queer female rappers like a young M.A. You know, I, I mean, she says exactly what a misogynistic man would say about women, word for word. Word, word by word. Yes, yes, yes. And that, that, that I'm, so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to unpack that <clears throat> still, like what it, what is the meaning of, of, of that? But also think about think about uh, Megan Thee Stallion, right? Yes. I mean, so here's a woman who spends a lot of her creative energy offering invective towards women. Like she she goes in on women all the time. Like she's yes. like these these these. You know, I, you know, I, I'll show these bees, these hating ass bees. I, and her whole thing is about even when she's being vulnerable, she's like, yeah, I was vulnerable, but these bees, I'm gonna go get them. And it's like this whole thing, which is really fascinating. 
And I, I shall hope for, I don't want to fool through, but this is me though. So hip hop again, if I don't want to live in that neighborhood, I can go somewhere else, right? So I don't have mm-hmm. to, I don't have to be, I can find South Rock and I have to deal with that. But it is conspicuous that, that a feminist voice that's not, like a, a woman that celebrates her own self-empowerment in, in a particularly male space, yeah. that she devotes so much of her creative energy, I would say across her songs on her consent for women. Yes, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, it's it's just, it's just kind of for me. I find that fascinating, and then you can, of course, look at Young and May. Who, yeah, uh, does what he just said. Uh, and Young and May is a, she's real talented in a way that I'm not sure people really fully know. I want to see more of her. I don't know if she's gonna fall off and be gone all together, but I, I've heard songs where she's had bars, and I was so wildly impressed with her. With her, with her you know? Indeed, indeed. I. uh I I, I want to share this too before we begin to wrap up. I just remember because Tupac to me is the greatest rapper ever to rap. It's art. We all have our different perspectives. One person's great artist may not be another. And I try to explain that to people all the time because we're talking about art. Some artists speak to people greater than others. My favorite poet is Langston Hughes. I don't like some of the European poets, <laughs> for example, right? But I remember being kind of disappointed because I felt like he knew better. Mm-hmm. But his use of homophobic language when he was on death row to uh to 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 chastise and castigate, you know, people like Andre Young, Dr. Dre, right? And, you know, and knowing that his mother, Afani Shakur, actually helped uh Black Power uh, gay organizations, help them write their mission statements, you know, and I have those like primary sources, right? Uh, and, you know, and it's like he know, and he grew up and had close friends who were, you know, on the queer spectrum, LGBTQI, out there on the West Coast, right? Marin City, Marin County. Uh, but I love him so much that that didn't stop me from, right, listening to his music and unfortunately even those songs right when he said those negative things uh is are us older people not maybe you and i as individuals but our generation are we too hard on the young people because they may listen to songs that have concepts and lyrics that we find extremely distasteful if not even problematic i don't think you know, my personal opinion is that um, collectively, people should critique pop culture. And culture is, I think, at its best when it's provocative and forces us to have conversations. And so I like to see this. I also like to see um, a good response that is logical and forces me to kind of reconsider some things. I know that when people ask, I've heard a whole bunch of rappers, they say, you know, why do you talk about X, Y, and Z? So that's because that's the world I see around me. But I can talk about, I look at Karis One, I go back to um, Love's Gonna Get You, right? Where, you know, he saw the drug trade. He saw the violence of it. NWA did, actually, right? The dope mm-hmm. man. And, yeah. and the, the narrative they weave wasn't to say this is what around me, so I'm too weak to do anything about it. Black people are too weak to do anything about it. Black people are so uncreative, we can't do anything about it. The only thing we do is participate in the destruction of our own community. They didn't think that, right? They said, I'm going to create a song that's going to talk about it, but I'm also going to talk about it in a way that is a cautionary tale to discourage you from engaging because it, uh, you know, I'm going to also critique the, like Ice Cube said, uh, Uncle Sam is Hitler without an oven bomb our neighborhood, then push the crack in, right? Like people call CIA the cocaine, um, what was it, import agency. And so so people were very clear about white supremacy, cut off our forms of, white, of, of oppression of Black people, as well as the illegal drug trade, and what it did to Black people, like the looking at uh, like, like brand new being slow down, right? This idea that you have a beautiful woman who had everything ahead of her, but she became an addict, right? She became a crack addict, and her life uh, withered away, right? That her, her beauty faded, and then what does this mean when someone's humanity is extracted because they're committed to this drug that's absolutely toxic, right? And so this celebration about, well, I got miles of money, I got these B's and H's, I got guns, I kill ninjas, 
and it's, I'm selling crack. It's great. I'm just describing what around me. I think that's a weak, I think personally, I think that's a very weak, anti-Black, uncreative way to examine the world around them, right? I like to, I like people to think that they can change their conditions and challenge the people who create those conditions in the first place. I like to see that. That's me. But maybe I'm just the one that's all messed up. Maybe I should just sit back and enjoy the songs of selling crack and killing Black people. But I want to see some more, I want to see something different, right? And mm -hmm. so uh, I think it, I think it's good for people to create because, you know, the interesting thing is that at that time, people were attacking them, right? In the 1980s, you know, you had all these people in uh, early 1990s for different reasons, as I, you know, as you know. And mm -hmm. um, I like to see art being provocative. I like to see people debate. I like to see discussion, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've been known to change my, I mentioned earlier how I used to argue that, you know, Rakim was in the, up there with, you know, brand new being all these conscious folks. And then I got challenged. I had to kind of remove him and come up there with Big Daddy Kane and take me mm -hmm. and the boys, you know, because he, he really wasn't out there talking the way I, I was thinking he was. So mm -hmm. I, I changed my policies. Like I say, I, I, I began writing the book with a hypothesis that proved not to be correct. So I had to change my my argument, you know. So I, I go where the evidence goes. Indeed, as, as we should. And I agree. <clears throat> our critique, I mean, because that's, in the end, I mean, that's one of the functions of art, and it is to be critiqued, to initiate conversation, debate, uh, and, and et cetera. So I agree. I don't think that we're being too hard. And we all have our taste. And my morals and ethics won't allow me to fall in love with a new rapper uh, that perpetuates those things. It's bad enough that I have to contend with the hypocrisy of rappers that did perpetuate those things from my youth that based on nostalgia every now and then i still like to listen to some of their songs like spice one i joke he killed a, a thousand black men every verse <laughs> in his music uh, but you know but i i just can't i can't yeah, get I, I got my contradictions too man like i uh, i love uh cypress hill right and cypress hill you know, had a whole song, like, right? you know, I would change the lyrics though. But I, you know, solo shotgun, handle the pump, sip yeah. on 40, pump on the blunt, pump my shotgun. I wouldn't say the ninjas didn't jump. I would actually change the lyrics, right? So I would I would do little things to make my soul uh, feel a little more comfortable. But I loved Cypress Hill. And then by 2006, when Rick Ross came out with Hustling, I couldn't fight that. I love that song. And it was yeah. mad ignorant. I mean, the video was actually pretty creative and somewhat, uh, the, the video was much more, I think affirming of, of people in the margins finding economic spaces and opportunities, right? In the yeah. informal economy and not just the drug trade. So you see little kids selling candy and everyone hustling, right? But the the, the lyrics, of course, aren't about kids selling m and kids selling water and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I feel you. I mean, I, I've, I've been there too. And I'm not a purist in that way. I think mm -hmm. that art is, art is complicated. You know, I mean, anyone who's a fan of, if you're a fan of visual art, I mean, if you, you know, very few artists don't have complicated lives that offer all sorts of contradictions. You know, um, it's hard, I think, to be a purist about life in general. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. I want to once again thank you, Dr. Ogbar, for joining us. Thank you for all your insights and your expertise. And I personally want to thank you for writing the scholarship that you have published. Uh, and I remember the first time I met you face to face. That's why to this day I still call you OG. I thought it was the coolest day. I'm reading a book about hip hop and then another one of your books about black power and your middle initials are OG. And I was like, yes, yeah, an OG, yeah, OG. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you, uh, yes, I remember uh, when I first met you at, I believe we were at one of the NCBS annual conferences uh, and you were talking about uh, black television shows. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it's been a while, maybe 10, 8, 9, 10 years around. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So, or it might have been a solid, but I believe that was NCBS. I, I, I can't recall. Yeah, I remember but, that. Yeah, but, uh, but thank you for what you do. Uh, and it is definitely uh, appreciated. And uh, my students greatly, greatly uh, loved your book, Hip Hop Revolution, last semester. Thank you, sir. I, I appreciate it, Dr. Walton. Thank you for having me. And uh, I hope people got a little out of it. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.